Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Steve Wally. I work for Microsoft. And I'm going to be talking to you about the first year of the Confidential Computing Consortium. And really, it, it's, it's been an exciting year. Uh, I was one of the founding members. But I want to have a discussion first to kind of put some context around it and have that discussion from the perspective of new thoughts on open source software nonprofits. Uh, I would ask that people keep their questions to the end. Uh, I'm not, I, I need glasses and I, I need to be able to do the distance thing properly. Uh, also, it'll help us hit our time mark a little bit better. So we're living in a really interesting period in the software industry right now. Uh, you know, we, we all go around saying open source has won. Uh, and when you look at OSI licensed projects under the umbrellas of all of these different nonprofits, you know, we've literally over the last few decades created tens of billions of dollars of software value. Uh, at the same time, software has been democratized. Uh, we're now drowning in software, uh, most of it mediocre, duplicative, and bad. Um, there's been an explosion in nonprofits in entirely new industries as well. Uh, and it, it's kind of a really interesting time from that perspective. Uh, you see some of these things happening on, in the, uh, under the Linux Foundation umbrella. You know, you look at LF Energy or the work that's coming out of Hollywood. So these are brand new industries that have lots of interesting software, lots of desire to collaborate, but they're coming into this space for really for the first time. And then there's this trend that we're starting to see of standards development organizations are moving towards uh, supporting OSI. While at the same time, uh, we're starting to see open source nonprofits starting to move towards supporting standards development. Um, you might have seen uh, Jim Zemlin's keynote this morning where he was talking about you know, the additional work that uh, the JDF has now organized to be able to uh, submit uh, specifications to ISO for standardization. So this is kind of a really interesting place. Um, I want to lay down a few ground rules about the way I think about open source. So I think about healthy OSI licensed project communities in this way. Um, you've published the code under an OSI approved license, and it's a declaration from the originating uh, community, whoever that small number of maintainers is, and it's a declaration of outbound sharing for any purpose, and you can have no expectations of anything in return. Um, contribution flow is the lifeblood of a successful OSI licensed project community. Uh, successful projects are transparent in their decision making. Uh, they support a growing, diverse community of you know, users and contributors and maintainers. And those really are um, three separate groups of folks within your community. Uh, these are not you know, one developer shows. The, um, you need to grow that user base to find the developers that are going to go selfishly experiment with your, your project. And then most users are just happy to use your software in that community, but they still identify with your community. And what that means is, you know, freeloaders means you're doing it right. Um, you need to make it easy to use, deploy, build, uh, and contribute to the project. And then you need to encourage selfish developers uh, to Sorry, I just had a pop-up that I wasn't expecting. Um, you need to encourage uh, selfish developers to contribute back to the project so they don't end up living on brittle and expensive forks. Um, and then you need to be trustworthy and fair. That's kind of the heart of your community. Sorry, we're learning to drive the interface. Um, it can all probably best be summed up, uh, I regularly paraphrase JFK's inaugural speech. Um, ask not what your community can do for you. You know, it's really about what you can do for your community. And it, and it really is that intention as you build a, a successful project community about its, its work on the community's shoulders to, to be doing that outreach, doing that uh, collaboration. You know, there's no magical community that just kind of shows up to help you do work. I'm also the, the person out there that um, argues 
and debates that there is no open source business model. Um, not gonna go into that here today, but there's a couple of things that I've written. Uh, one, I tackle it from the perspective of engineering economics and why open source is, is such a, a key in our industry and that level of collaboration. But I also, when you're gonna run a software business, you need to run the business. And so again, I've, I've tackled the debate from that perspective as well. So, you know, we're, we're not gonna, chase that today. But these are things that I, I think inform where how nonprofits play in the space. Um, so I want to talk about the early open source nonprofit history. This was, uh, I, I was technical director at the Outer Curve Foundation. This was a nonprofit that was sponsored into existence. Uh, it was a 501c3, which under US tax law says you, you've, sorry, a C6, which under US tax law says you've been created uh, as a member organization. Um, Microsoft was the founding sponsor, creating it to support open source projects that had something to do with Microsoft technologies. Um, it was, they hired in uh, Paula Hunter as the executive director. And a few months after that, she hired me in as the technical director. And our challenge was to figure out, so what is the playbook? because we had existing examples. Uh, the Free Software Foundation has been around since 1985. Um, the Apache Software Foundation came into existence in, I believe, 99. The Pearl Foundation and the other, there were a few language foundations at that point. Um, the original OSDL came in in uh, 1999. And then Eclipse uh, uh, was created as a foundation in about 2006. So there was, there was examples to look at but all of these things had been created for very specific purposes. And when we, when we did the analysis, where we, we ended up was to realize that all of these nonprofits created IP safety, which enabled companies to then participate, both from uh, consuming it into, you know, as components into products and services, as well as to be able to contribute their changes back. Uh, and the other thing that these nonprofits were doing was to uh, remove liability from the original project maintainers. You know, as you start to, as, as you host a conference, you, you need some kind of legal protection between you and your personal bank account. So that's what these early foundations kind of started off as. They were, they were creating IP safety and a neutral playing field, and they were removing liability. And they did this often by add, and adding and providing services to the projects. Uh, Paula and I captured this. Uh, the document uh, URL is is there in the uh, lower left of the screen. But we captured it in, a, in a, a paper called "The Rise and Evolution of the Open Source Software Foundation." But that was, you know, that was published seven years ago now. Um, and and I won't say things have changed, but things continue to evolve. Um, we felt fairly good about the analysis, though, at the time, because uh, Henrik Ingo who he's currently at Mongo, but at the time uh, was uh, part of the leadership of MariaDB and he came out of the MySQL space. Uh, Henrik got access to a data set that was available at the time and did a big number crunch on it. And what he discovered was the nine most vibrant large communities were all hubbed inside of nonprofits. The 10th, was an order of magnitude smaller and hubbed in a company. So they're, they're, he's a good engineer. He, he did not make claim, you know, any kind of causality claims about this data crunch, but clearly there was a strong correlation. And so, so Paula and I kind of ran with that as the, as the early playbook. And so you, you have this kind of simple idea that you've got uh, the evolution of an open source project. You've got this initial group of committers, maintainers. Um, you start to find contributors. You're building your community. And the code base gets better and better and bigger until finally you've got some kind of ecosystem. And the aha was realizing that there's this point in a project's growth. If it's a well-run project, it's got to be a healthy project. But there's this point where companies start to circle the project. They want to use the components. And in using it, they also want to be able to contribute back. And they want to be able to do this in the, 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 the products and services. 
and the need to have some confidence that the there's safety in this IP. And so that's what you see as a spark for a lot of these organizations. Um, the, the problem is this is probably the cl closer to reality diagram. You know, you don't know that you're logically going to reach this great ecosystem state. Um, and so the kind of the, the strength of it is by adding the nonprofit as an umbrella, by creating this legal framework, you've now created IP neutrality, created IP safety, you've removed the liability. And so the project, if you have a healthy project, it can now grow to that next level. And in growing to that next level, you're enabling companies to start to create products and services around it. Um, my favorite example in this space, uh, the Apache Software Foundation. In June of 1999, there was roughly 30,000 lines of code. Um, and three months later, there was roughly 90,000 lines of code. Now, people didn't rush out and quickly write 60,000 lines of code. But I think what it's giving folks a flavor for, it, the, the kind of the backlog of companies that had been using the Apache HTTPD at the heart of their products and services and didn't know how to get off the fork, didn't know how to contribute, weren't comfortable with the IP management environment of the original Apache project. And so by cleaning that whole situation up, you end up in this space where the project can begin to grow again in new and interesting ways. So really it, it's what we're seeing now is kind of those added layers of experience that I don't know that Paula and I did a great job of documenting in, in the kind of proto playbook back then. But if you've got, um, you know, you can remove the IP safe, uh, you can create IP safety, you can remove the liability, but you also end up in a space where the foundation, that nonprofit is adding stability to the project. Um, it does this through, you know, direct services for infrastructure and such. It can do just simple experience, um, you know, helping provide code of conduct infrastructure, uh, helping folks understand how they need to handle CVE reporting. Uh, with uh, embargoes in place and such, you know, that next level of engagement that's going to help the community grow. Um, it creates a legal backstop to protect the project. Um, it also creates a, a center of gravity within the industry. And so you can attract a bigger industry conversation through the members and sponsors of, of the organization itself. Um, you also see larger nonprofits begin to create a focus for community discussions across the projects that are related to one another. I want to be really clear here. I am not talking about forced architecture that we're somehow fitting these things together as, as blocks that must, you know, either depend on one another or call one another or layer on one another. Uh, I'm really just talking about the, the interaction in the technical advisory groups that begin to happen in a nonprofit. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a moment. And so this really is this idea that if you have a healthy project, um, it benefits in a well-run nonprofit. So let's talk about the Confidential Computing Consortium. Um, this, this is something that I've been party to for the last year. Uh, I helped in the kind of formalization discussions and the planning for it. So I wanna help folks understand what does it look like if you're going to create one of these things? Uh, the Confidential Computing Consortium, just to lay the foundation for everybody, um, it is a community of uh, partners, of members that are is focused on uh, supporting open source uh, licensed projects that are securing data in use. Uh, this is a relatively new technology space, so as opposed to you know, data at rest in storage or data in transit on the network, this is data in use in computation. Um, and it's it's a new enough uh, space that collectively the members also want to make sure that we're educating the marketplace to understand exactly what this does and doesn't do and how it provides it. Uh, we announced our intent to form uh, last August at this event. And uh, we kind of formally kicked off with members and such uh, last October. So when you go through the planning phase, the planning probably started in April. Uh, for an August launch. 
And we, as, as you saw that, you know, we still didn't quite formalize until October uh, because, you know, there's still people signing paper and, and cutting checks and such, excuse me. Um, it really is one of those situations that, you know, it starts with two partners who each kind of invite another couple of partners who tell two partners. And pretty soon you have a collection of people interested in the discussion. That doesn't mean they're going to sign up, but they're at least interested enough to participate at that, at that point in history. Um, we chose to come to the Linux Foundation. Uh, as, as the parent organization. Uh, it was a suggestion that I kind of encouraged at the time because all of the companies, for the most part, uh, were comfortable with that legal structure. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, but the great part of the planning is you step into a discussion with uh, Linux Foundation staff who have done this before so they can help you start to think about the things you're gonna have to do. So one of the, one of the first things you'll wrestle with is you know, what, what do membership fees look like? And so we started with a prototypical budget. And it was if we were going to do these sorts of things, then it would cost this sort of money. So if we had this many members, the fees would have to look like this. And you go back and forth on that to get a sense of really where to, where's the stake in the ground to say, we think this many of us in the conversation right now will join at a premier level or a general level and this is how much money we'll kick off with. Um, we also had a, a prototypical charter that we inherited and you know it was a reasonable starting point and as you read through it you realize that you know obviously a couple of changes you have to make to it to declare that you know this is the scope of the confidential computing consortium but again you have a reasonable charter with which to begin the, the process. Um, and then you fall into launch planning, um, lots of discussion and debate, you know, who's gonna be on stage, where are you going to launch the event? You know, the, cho the choice of doing it in San Diego at this event was part of that debate and discussion. And then uh, th that idea of, you know, debating projects, you know, who, what projects will we start with? What are the examples of projects that we want to encourage people to understand? This is why we're here. And that's a really important thing to kind of have those small anchors. Um, back before Outer Curve was created, uh, I was consulting in those days. I happened to be asked to take a look at the plans. And one of the, you know, I, I kind of looked at the plans and it was all reasonable. And I said, that's great. Um, you'll need to pick a reasonable launch event, get 10 CEOs up on stage with you talking about why they joined. Um, and at the time, Microsoft had the relationships in various different companies that had a real affinity for open source that they could have easily done that because there was lots of interesting companies shipping open source based product on Windows. Um, make sure you hire a strong uh, executive director who's kind of knows what they're going to do. And you'll need a project, some kind of project to demonstrate for folks. What is this nonprofit all about? Uh, the unfortunate part at the time was none of those things quite happened as they launched. And it took them another almost six months to get all of those things in place. So it was really important that we at least had some projects that we were talking about as we were coming forward into planning the consortium to anchor in people's understanding in their imagination even where we were going. Um, so we announced, and we had, this, is, this was our launch partners. Um, and it was a strong group of eight uh, premier members and nine uh, general members, and it, it was a good mix. We, we've got, you know, hardware vendors in the mix uh, with ARM and Intel. You've got cloud service providers across the, the space and uh, a, a good group of software companies that all care about this confidential computing space. And so that was, you know, we had a good launch event. We, we, felt, we felt good about it. Um, the structure that you inherit, uh, if you're doing this under the auspices of the Linux Foundation, looks basically like this for a lot of these uh, directed funds. You have a governing board. The governing board, the governing board's job, is really, uh, you know, money and members. That's what you should care about. Uh, do we have enough money to do the things we need to do to support our projects, to support the message, and uh, what do we have to do with respect to new members? and adding, you know, possibly maintaining that budget. 
Uh, we've got, we do that through subcommittees. Uh, the important one here is the outreach subcommittee. Um, some groups call that the marketing committee. We felt strongly enough that there was enough product management uh, weight on the bench that this was more than just some marketing folks. You know, really, we had folks that deeply understood the space as product managers and could speak to it and do the work. So we really wanted to call it the outreach committee. Um, then you have your technical advisory council. Um, this is where the engineers, there's one per premier member, um, plus each project at a certain level would have a member on the, uh, a voting member in the technical advisory council. Um, but this is the group that's going to vet project proposals against their criteria to say, yes, that belongs inside of the Confidential Computing Consortium. Um, it's the group that's going to debate how much, uh, how, how we best support those projects with services and how much money that that's going to cost. Um, and then you've got the actual projects themselves that get slotted in as each is accepted uh, as its own little project LLC. This is simple legal framework to ensure that you know all the I's are dotted and all the T's are crossed with respect to trademark ownership and ensuring that the nonprofit status of the entire chain is maintained. So there's, there's, it looks like a lot of legal craziness, but it actually has a fairly simple purpose. Um, over the last nine months, lots of work has happened. Um, Technical Advisory Council in its first face to face meeting uh, accepted the first three projects. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, they've debated diligently a, a definition of confidential computing. And this was when you looked at that set of members, you know, it does represent a weight and a center of gravity in the industry. And they didn't, they still didn't just kind of come up with a definition. They did a deep survey across things like, you know, what's the ITF definition? What are the other definitions that are available from NIST or the IEEE? So it was, it was a concerted effort to kind of coalesce on a definition that we all felt strongly about. Um, they continue to uh, improve the project acceptance criteria. They've accepted two more uh, projects that just over the last couple of months, and we'll talk about that in a moment. The outreach committee at the same time has been really busy. Um, they've uh, developed a messaging framework that I'll show you briefly in a moment that ensures that everybody has a consistent message across the membership. Um, they've been running analyst briefings with uh, the likes of Gartner and Forrester, uh, developed a current white paper that was published today on the web um, that you can uh, certainly get access to both from our website or if you come and visit our booth. Um, and they're beginning to plan uh, a conference for uh, hopefully face-to-face -face, um, next year, but we'll very likely explore some kind of virtual event in the fall this year. And there's still other work. So to give you a sense of that budget, um, we're working with about $800,000 per year in membership right now. And because of both the pandemic lockdown, but as well, we just, we were still finding our stride of how much money did we feel comfortable spending, how fast, we'll end up exiting our first year with a, a good healthy surplus in place going into the second year. And I'm a big believer that if you're going to run a nonprofit, you always sort of want a year in the bank because you're never sure what kind of economic downturn you're gonna see. Um, none of us were expecting the pandemic but I'm actually confident we have a, a, an operating budget for next year already in place. Um, and then we're looking to start an end user advisory council come the fall. Um, we continue to pick up members. Uh, that was our, our announcement today was the white paper plus all of our new members. Uh, we're up to 10 uh, premier members now and 15 general members. At this point, you know, we've added the rest of the kind of first wave of uh, chip vendors that care about this confidential computing space and we continue to add other interested companies so again the we're building a center of gravity here to have an, an important industry conversation and it's a very collaborative group of people um projects uh the first three projects through the door well, these were discussions that started all the way back in our planning phase um SGX SDK for Linux came in from Intel. Uh, the Open Enclave SDK came in from Microsoft. And NRX uh, was a new project last spring. And so Red Hat was really keen to participate and has been a great participant all the way along in this. 
Um, so those were those first three projects that we that the TAC tested against the criteria, and and to a certain extent found the criteria wanting and have continued to evolve it since. Um, and then this spring, we've uh, accepted Graphene. Uh, the TAC has also accepted the Trusted Compute Framework. Now, the Trusted Compute Framework, it's an Intel project that will be changing its name because they realized the name wasn't descriptive. Um, Graphene's a really interesting project because it's our first project that really is coming from a non-member. It's coming in from the research community. And so we're, we're going through, you know, it's again, it's challenging some of our assumptions in our process. And that's a really important thing to understand as you come into these, uh, as you create a nonprofit, is that you need to be almost flexible with your rules as you figure out, oh, these rules that looked really good to start with actually might need to change a bit. Um, so we're working our way through some of that. Um, this slide, I, I am not taking you through all the details, but it's the messaging framework that the outreach committee came up with. And again, what it ensures is that there's all of the product management teams across all of our members have a consistent way to describe and discuss confidential computing, the significance of confidential computing, and what market problem is it solving, what's the role of the confidential computing consortium, and ensure that everybody's at least consistent with the base message. Now, recognize we're all companies in this space. You know, it's important for us that this is part of our story to our customers, and we'll start to layer our product and service messages on top of this framework. But this is this becomes the foundational framework that we all start from. So I want to kind of pop back up for a second um, and, and talk about nonprofits in general again. Um, you need to create a culture. And when I talk about culture, this is this is my definition of a culture. You know, it's a collection of beliefs and practices of a community that evolves carefully and it creates the success across generations. You know, generations as people come and go, because they do. Um, and the reason I wanted to kind of take this approach is if you don't set the culture you want in a new nonprofit, then you'll get the culture that happens. And it may be somewhat chaotic. It may not be what you want. It certainly may surprise you. Um, so you need to kind of go in with an intent to create a particular culture. So let's talk about how the culture we've been creating in our first year as the, as the consortium. Um, you know, kind of we the members immediately interpret our, our charter uh, in a series of board uh, resolutions to allow everyone to participate across the meetings. Um, some organizations in their charters tend to create silos and they tend to try and make voting. You know, if you read the charter, you'd think, well, this is all about voting. And what we've been trying to do is re reduce voting down to really the boring stuff, like minutes from the last meeting, you know, money and members. And so we also wanted to tear down those silos. So uh, the outreach chair is a regular participant in the technical advisory council. Uh, we have governing board members that serve in a number of different places. Uh, the TAC chair is a member of the governing board, but is also a regular visitor in the outreach committee. And again, there's no requirements for this and there's no barriers to prevent other people in the TAC from attending and, and they do. So this is, it, we wanted this to be as open and transparent an organization and to kind of tear down the, the communication silos. Um, you know, we, we the members also publish our minutes publicly. Uh, we do reserve the right to drop into an executive governing board session because there may be sensitive discussions. Uh, code of conduct comes to mind and we've had a code of conduct challenge that we had to solve. Uh, that was, a minuted governing board meeting, but those minutes are not uh, made available, uh, or not publicly published. Um, there could be comp compensation discussions at some future point. You know, there, there are reasons to fall into executive session, but for the most part, our, we would like people to be able to see what we're doing and what we're working on so that they can feel good about participating. Um, not that long ago, uh, 
an organization was trying to en encourage uh, me wearing my Microsoft hat to join their nonprofit. And I said, great, uh, you've been around for like almost two years. I'd love to see the last 12 to 18 months of your board minutes. Now, my intent here is to understand who's attending the, the meetings, what decisions are coming out of the, the meetings, like who's there and what are you doing? I, I honestly don't care about the aspirational intent of the nonprofit. I want to actually understand what's the work. Um, and I was told that I couldn't see the board minutes because they were private. I thought, you're asking me for some reasonably serious money. I'm not joining until I see the board minutes. So it's a, it's a really simple thing that, no, as far as we're concerned, we publish our board minutes. Um, we, we live in a world of minimum viable governance. Uh, that great expression came from Sarah Novotny. Um, I've always admired organizations that have grown carefully and thoughtfully and continue to succeed 30 years later. Things like uh, the IETF and the work they continue to do. They evolved a governance structure that worked for them over time. Um, but it was never more government governance than you needed at that moment in history. Uh, you can see the same kind of success in the Apache Software Foundation. Um, our, TAC, um, our TAC chair, by our charter, is a member, a voting member of the board. But we didn't want that to start to look like vote gathering. So our TAC chair basically agreed that they will abstain from all governing board uh, votes. And it's that simple because the person who was elected by the group, uh, by the TAC as TAC chair, happens to work for Microsoft. Uh, I'm the current governing board chair. I work for Microsoft. And we did not want this to start to look like people were gathering votes. Um, TAC chair runs all meetings open. Um, we hire very few services from the Linux Foundation because in our way of looking at things, we are the domain experts, we are the domain specialists. And it doesn't matter whether you're looking at the outreach committee or whether you're looking at uh, the TAC. These are the domain specialists in this space. And we are the best people to do the work, even though it's, you know, it's volunteers working and collaborating to a certain extent, just like an open source project. And we'll come back to that idea a couple of times. Um, there is a real get work done ethic within the within all of the committees um, just like you see in a, in a healthy open source project you know everybody is willing to do the hard work chopping wood and carrying water that you hear about associated with open source projects because that's the best way to get things done uh, we have a fabulous uh, program manager from the Linux Foundation and we put things uh, in their queue and they get stuff done up for us all the time um, so it's not that we don't use the Linux Foundation services. The Linux Foundation is a great service organization to us as a directed fund under the auspices of the Linux Foundation. Um, but there was things in our prototype budget like uh, PR services. Now, we all collectively had experience with the PR firm. They're a great PR firm. But for our size and where we are in our history, we didn't need a lot of noise and a monthly billing for it. What we needed was to ensure that we were getting the kind of foundational work done and figuring out how we want to message that. And so we, we will absolutely look to hire some of these things in the future. But right now, it's we, the members, doing it. Um, and like I said, it really has been about reducing that idea that this is not about uh, voting, uh, that you know, vote, voting really is money, members, and minutes. The other thing that we were trying to do, uh, when you talk about culture, ritual is important in creating human culture. And so you know, as, as twee and trite as that might sound, um, this slide with a different uh, title on it shows up at the start of all meetings. Uh, governing board meets once a month. Uh, the TAC meets for two hours every other week. Uh, outreach meets for an hour every week. But we always start here because this is the reminder of this is why we're here. This is who we are and the culture we believe in. And we really do care, like the, the, the breadth of our culture in, in incorporates things like a harassment free environment. Um, that we really you know, care about the diversity and inclusivity of the work that we're doing. Um, so that's something that shows up. The other slide that shows up all the time for us 
is our antitrust policy. Um, antitrust policy is actually a really important thing. Uh, and, and I want to tackle that from a, a more general statement. Open source nonprofits are legal structures. They exist to uh, hold shared assets. They remove liability, as we've discussed, but they formally, in their legal structure, remove that liability. And then there is a class of them that are member organizations that provide antitrust protections. It's insurance. Um, you know, collaboration is good, collusion not so much. That's a really important thing to kind of carry forward. So there, there are, you'll occasionally hear people snipe at the Linux Foundation that it's pay to play, it's all the big vendors. Now it's not always big vendors. Um, and the pay to play that you're seeing is a collection of vendors needs a legal framework to collaborate. And so those membership dues are insurance. You know, so we need the legal framework because otherwise, you know, you've, you've got a collection of partners and or competitors in a room together. And so you put in place this legal framework to give you protection from, from antitrust law. So that, that's the reason that our minutes are structured the way our minutes are. You know, every meeting, the attendees are noted by membership. Um, every meeting, the decisions that happened in that meeting are captured in the minutes. This is the, 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 the log of what we've done. And so at any time, if somebody tried to accuse us of, you know, collusion, we could actually pull out all the minutes and demonstrate that, no, no, this, you know, transparently, we're an organization that is collaborating in these ways. So why would you join or sponsor one of these open source nonprofits? Um, you know, really, there's a set of reasons that uh, all boil down to the, the mission benefits the company story to, to customers. Um, when Paula and I were, were doing the original work, you know, we, we talked a lot about that idea of you're supporting and funding services to projects um, that you care about, that have a clear IP management need. You're providing the, they, these in return provide the building blocks for you, the business. But that's really only one thing that, that fits. Um, you know, our, at the, in the consortium, we, we aren't capped at just projects from members. Any project can come to us. Um, we're not making these projects healthy only for members. We're making them healthy for broad use in a new technology domain. Um, as a member, you're directly creating and funding the collateral build out and development process for consistent messaging. Um, that goes all the way back to the foundation of the OSDL, which became the Linux Foundation. You know, the, the early message was this IP is safe in the teeth of kind of the competitive messaging that was going on from the likes of Microsoft Sun and Oracle. Um, you're directly engaging in these committee discussions, which accelerates innovation. I'm always amazed. I sit in on all the TAC meetings, not because this is my domain of expertise, but because of the number of things I learn listening to some of the best folks in the industry debate some of these issues and come up with that collaborative agreed on solution. Um, the nonprofit is a shared cost structure, so you aren't eating the cost of this and going it your own way. And being a member creates that direct association of the company brand with the nonprofit brand. For Again, it basically is benefiting your story to customers. Um, and one of the, the things that's kind of a secondary thing but was fascinating is the hallway conversations. You suddenly, as, as a, you know, Big companies and small companies together in a room with a common goal opens up discussions for companies to partner in ways that they might not have otherwise thought to have those discussions. So I think that's a real benefit for membership as well. Um, I want to finish up with just a few ideas for folks that um, I've seen some challenges. And I think the, the best way is to go back to the magic diagram. You know, there's this wonderful stylized idea and the dream of most corporate owned uh, or corporate controlled open source projects is again, that they're gonna have this, this great growing uh, wave of source code and people loving them for it. Um, 
there's a little more structure that suddenly shows up because you're thinking, yeah, our partners and our customers can be, become contributors. Um, the reality though, is these things are often kicked off very early in their life. So they haven't become a successful open source community. And the company may not have done the deeper analysis to figure out what's the goal here. Um, in the business side of the world, I argue, if you're a software company and you're doing open source projects, those projects sit in either the context space. And what I mean by that, best example, I can give you a, a Spinnaker from Netflix. There is nothing about the Spinnaker CI CD system that is directly connected to the revenue stream of uh, streaming video content to all of your customers' devices. It's, it's context software. It's the tooling you create to do the business. Um, there's complement value add software, but the inter interesting projects in this kind of complement to the core value proposition. Uh, an easy example there would be the Azure CLI um, is an open source project that Microsoft runs. And it is in the complement space of making Azure easier to use for a class of user, but it's not part of the core Azure value proposition. And then there's your core value proposition to your customers. What's the thing that, you, what problem are you solving for your customers? Um, setting customer and partner expectations in community, community is really critical and depends on what, which of those three buckets you're trying to play in. Uh, at the same time, knowing your company goal really requires you to understand which of these buckets are we playing in. And so there's a lot of analysis that has to go on as you take this fledgling open source project into the pipeline. And I think what the, the biggest challenge then becomes, um, they wanna go big fast. And they think the nonprofit is the way to make that project go big fast. And this is where I, I, I kind of push back because I think there's a few simple rules here. A nonprofit will not make an OSI licensed project healthy. The project community has to be healthy in and of itself. Remember, go all the way back to that kind of the first couple of slides that I put up. There is a, what a healthy project looks like. That has to exist before you can get the growth amplification in a nonprofit. Um, likewise, a nonprofit will not create culture for you. Um, I think that's some of where you see kind of chaotic cultures in some of these newer foundations is because folks thought, I, I'm, I'm gonna create a nonprofit and then good stuff's gonna happen. And they don't realize that you have to create that culture. The nonprofit will amplify whatever culture is there. And so I think that's really important to get right. Um, and then you, at the end of the day, you get out of the nonprofit what you put into it. That, that ethic that came out of uh, op, you know, strong, successful open source community projects, uh, chopping wood and carrying water, doing the boring work that's necessary to carry the mission forward, that applies at the level of the nonprofit as well. And while some of the, those things can be done by employees that you might hire through your membership or services that you might hire in from the Linux Foundation, or there's a number of companies in this space that can do it for you. At the end of the day, the members have to, there have to be enough members that care deeply enough to actually do that wood chopping and water carrying. And with that, uh, that's all I have to say today. Uh, I am happy to answer any questions. We've got uh, almost 10 minutes left. And let me throw these on so I can actually read screens. Um, does anybody have any questions? I'm not seeing any questions show, showing up in the chat. Um, I am around. Uh, I'm around for all three days. Uh, I will be spending a certain amount of time in the uh, Confidential Computing Consortium booth, but also you can always reach me. Uh, I, I, always available by email if folks have specific questions they want to discuss.
So with that, I'd like to thank everybody for their time this afternoon, and I wish you all a good conference.